All right, we are live. Thank you everybody for joining K Kimball and I today. Now what I have to do is I have to mute myself on the, on the live stream. Thanks for everybody for your patience. So I'm not hearing myself talk. We have Kimball Parker, CEO and founder of 650. Kimball, welcome to this special episode of Law Subscribed Live. Hey, thank you for having me. So longtime listeners know that 650 has been a sponsor of the podcast for a really long time. Obviously really appreciate the support. And I have been itching and I'm so grateful to finally have Kimball on the show so that we can learn from the CEO himself about the company, its origin. Yeah, I've talked about the product. I've talked about how I'm using it. But I was also finally hearing from folks who heard about it from the podcast and how it's benefiting them, whether it's their business or their practice. And so I thought it was about time to have you on to talk about the product too. And then we, you know, we'll look into our crystal ball and we'll figure out, we'll predict what's going to happen in the future. But before we get into that, Kimball Parker, tell my audience a little bit about yourself. So I, I'm an attorney. Um, Matt, before we started to go live, asked me whether I still consider myself an attorney, even though I'm running this business. <laughs> and I do. I still think of myself as an attorney. I live in Salt Lake City. I have a family and some small kids that that's taking up a lot of my life. And then yeah, then I'm helping run 650 as well. And so did you ever think you would start this legal tech company? Like, why, like, how did you end up down this path? After practicing for several years, I joined the faculty of a law school, of BYU Law School, and I started a project with the dean there called Law X. And the idea of that project was we pick one area of the law that people really had a difficult time with if they could not afford an attorney. And then we try to automate it and to create a software solution to it within one term. And so it was a little bit, we would hack away at it for figure out the problem, hack away at it, and then release a product to the public after one semester. And so uh, I was with nine, nine students and the, the first issue we picked was debt collection. Mm -hmm. So in Utah, it's a massive problem. There are 70,000 uh, debt collection lawsuits a year. It ends up being about two thirds of all lawsuits filed in the state are to collect wow. a debt from a person. And 98.5 or between 98 and 99% of people who are sued cannot afford an attorney. And so they just face that process alone. And about 80% of them do not even respond to the lawsuit. In Utah and a lot of states, if you don't respond to the lawsuit within 21 days in writing, you lose the case automatically and you default. And so 80% of people default. And so we looked at that problem. I had been, a, I was a litigator, so I had answered who knows how many lawsuits, a lot of them. And it's not the most complicated thing in the world. It's not intuitive. Somebody couldn't off the street, couldn't figure it out from scratch, but, but it's pretty easy. And so we just basically scraped my brain about how to respond to a lawsuit. We plugged it into a pretty simple document automation tool and we released it out to the public. We called it solo suit. And when we released it, we thought, geez, I hope like 50 people use this a year. And now several years later, over 200,000 people have used that tool got a lot of usage. It got some media attention. And that caught the eye of this law firm, Wilson Sonsini. That was the law firm. When I was in law school, I wanted to work at Wilson Sonsini. Actually, they're such a cool law firm. They, they like helped found Google and helped found Apple, but they only, they only interviewed the smartest people in my class, which I was not a part of. <laughs> like any, like, like any good entrepreneur and problem solver, you found a different way to work with them. That's right. Yeah. So they saw what I had done at BYU. And then they expressed some interest in doing a similar thing, but for their clients, for certain legal issues that, that their clients were facing. And so they poached me away. I was also um, working at a law firm too. So I was doing both at the same time. And so they, they, they poached me away and we founded 650 together, me and them. Yeah. Uh, and so that was about five years ago. Yep. So that's how 650 got started. Yeah, I, I have to imagine, and maybe one of these days we'll have someone from Wilson Sonsini on the podcast to talk about it, but I have to imagine there were a lot, there's a lot of inbound to that firm, given their reputation, that they were just matters that were too small or didn't make sense to charge a high expensive billable hour, but they saw a business opportunity there. And so this is like addressing that latent market in the same way that Uber and Lyft came in to address a massive latent market of people who would pay somebody to drive them from point A to point B, it just wasn't an option to do that before Uber and Lyft. Now, with a tool like 650, you're able to serve that same market that has is really priced out, like either priced out of or due to budget constraints or wanting to know how much outside counsel spend is going to be. 
like this tool fills that market, right? Am, am I right about that? Yeah, I think that there, that there are some areas of law that are very hard for a service type model to address. And one of those areas, one attribute of those areas are areas of law that change all the time. Mm -hmm. If you create a document, let's say like a legal document for a client, and then the law is changing every month and the law impacts that document, like that's really hard for a service model to address because then you have to go back to the person, you have to build them again to make the change. That is a great model for technology. Yeah. So because then you can make one change and you can push it out to thousands of clients. And so, and whereas a one-to-one -one model, you have to make that change every single time. And so that, that's, that was some of the motivation for what was driving them to look into this. One of those areas of law several years ago was privacy law. Mm -hmm. There were new privacy laws coming out all the time. They were changing different regulatory bodies were giving color to the different statutes and different requirements were coming out. And it was just really hard for companies to stay on top of it. And it was hard for their service model to do it too. And so we actually, we started in privacy. We helped address like this wave of privacy laws that came in. And then about three years ago, we started to address employment law. And we did that because everybody was starting to work remote. So all of a sudden companies, even of a small size, started to have employees all over the place. Every state has different laws, different employment laws, and all those employment laws change all the time. Every time one of these state legislatures meet, they amend the employment laws in the state. And so they're constantly changing and um, very hard for a company to stay on top of that and very hard for the law firm service model to address it. And so we got into employment law. That has been our biggest area, highest growth. And now we've really doubled down on that. And that's basically all we do now. We just do, we're an employment law platform for HR teams. Uh, one of, I have to imagine one of your favorite products then is this employee handbook creator for all 50 states. What was the, was that essentially the origin story of that piece among yeah. some other employment things? And I got to imagine it's a pretty popular tool out of all the offerings that you have. Yeah, so we started to, to hear from clients that they were really struggling. They started to have people in a bunch of locations. Their employee handbook is very hard to keep up. So they then had to add Arizona or Arkansas or Montana or Washington. And all of those places have different rules about sick leave or different color about how to do certain things. And so we worked with Wilson Sonsini and to create like a 50 state employee handbook, one that could vary based on where all, where your employees were. And then we plugged it in with some really cool automation that, that we built over the years. And that really kicked off. So we, we released that about three years ago. And that, that is now the core of our company is that employee handbook product. And then we've expanded within employment out to a uh, hiring paperwork where the same issues the same issues are there depending on where your employee is located you have to have different terms in your hiring paperwork and then we've also done separation paperwork as well so birth to death covering all the documents that that a company needs there for, for employment law yeah yeah there's so many different ways we could take this but in particular like e even going back to the privacy aspect because e even for just the employee handbook of it all although this is true whenever there's an update to regulations around Look at what happened with the FTC. I know when you guys came out with a lot of great programming when that rule came down. And at this point in time, we'll still see what happens. But yeah, we'll, yeah, it's still up in the air. Comply right now. You got to comply. And, and you have some great tools around that, like the notice to provide and that automation and all that. Uh, but, but the point of that is that there's updates all the time to employment regulations in different jurisdictions, like with privacy law, where you got to keep up to date all the time. The same thing is true for employment law. And even right in the tool, because of course I'm a user of it as well, like I could see when something needs an update because I've selected when I'm going through it, the applicable jurisdictions when you're filling out the document automation. And so maybe obviously without giving away the secret sauce, like how does that, like how does the system even know? How do you keep it up to date? And, and then how does it like go in? What does it mean needs an update and what actually happens uh, in the document when somebody could see that and go in and fix it? So I know I just threw a lot at you, but take it in any way you want. Yeah, this is something that we've worked on a lot and that we're actively working on now. 
one of the riddles that we figured out in the beginning of this company is we would create an employee handbook for a company. They would then take that handbook and they would make it their own. So they would like change, hey, I want this phrasing to be a little more friendly. I want this to be a little more strict. I want to change this or change that. Or, and, but after they took it and customized it, it was very difficult for us to put updates into it. And so if the client never touched it, if they just took it whole cloth from us, then we could just generate a new one for them and it would be like nothing happened with the update. But what do you do when a client has <laughs> customized it? And so we, we noodled on this for years, literally. And uh, what we have now, I, actually, I think is a really unique thing in the market. Basically, we can move a legal update and put it into a customized document through uh, generative AI. And so it'll scan through the employee handbook. It'll see, oh, wait, I think probably that update should go in this paragraph. And it'll slide it in as a red line. And then the user can go in, look at their employee handbook, and they can see the red line and approve it. So we, we still put a human in the loop. We say, and we give them a little warning saying, look at these red lines carefully to make sure that, and that they work. And, but it works great. There, we've figured out the places where it doesn't work and we shut those off but we can put really meaningful updates into people's employee handbooks in real time and just push those live for them. Uh, that is that is incredible. Big fans of Gen AI and Law Subscribed. When lawyers aren't billing time, the more quickly we could get to end results that, that are valuable for the clients, the, the better. And that is, I'm like just trying to think about like where we're going with Gen AI, right? There's a lot of this drafting from scratch stuff using some of these tools, but then there's something to that bespoke crafted thing that could then still be augmented with Gen AI. And it sounds like that is where 650 has ended up. Yeah, I think our kind of the core process that a user goes through when they answer a questionnaire, that questionnaire has really complicated logic in it. So if you choose, I'm in California and I have this many employees and I have this preference, it'll give you a different question than if you choose Arizona. And we plugged all of that logic in, into these really complex question flows. That has no Gen AI on it. And I actually think that is a real benefit for us because it produces the same thing every single time. It's 100% predictable. Right. Gen AI is still a little unpredictable when it's just left to its own devices. And so it's, it's not quite accurate enough that you'd want to use it for something as high stakes as like a legal thing. But... Something like putting in an edit into a document is perfect because basically you can say, put this at into this document and do not look at anything else. So you're limiting it. All the hallucinations and everything that you get with generative AI does not occur with that. You basically say, only look at this document and then apply it to this document, this red line into this doc. And it does it great. And that's something that it would take somebody... I don't know, 20 minutes to figure that out within a document. And now Gen AI can do it immediately. So right. it's it's really an area where the G Gen AI is like taking something that a human used to have to do and now can tune it up and get it right. And, and for those who are tuning in, because I've been engaged a lot on LinkedIn with folks that are question, that, that question, the billable hour going away. They think it's going to be here forever. Uh, so hopefully they're tuning in right now or they're listening. They're new listeners of the podcast. I saw some new subscribers come in. And this is for them is that should scare you as a lawyer if you're billing your time. And I think I think it should, and I want it to. I want it to scare them, right? Because that is a legal billable thing, is being able to analyze a document and figure out where does the language go in. And now I know 650 is not, it's not a law firm. It says in all the things, consult your lawyer. It's not UPL. It's not all these other things. And as a lawyer, I could benefit from that. And so when I, and, and I could verify it as a licensed attorney, right? Or an in-house attorney, right? Would verify this for a company that's using the tool, but they should be scared because I think that this is just one tiny example that you just gave Kimball, but you can, it can be extrapolated to outside of 650 products. Yeah. Right. So the lawyers need to be, they, they should be thinking about other ways to price their legal services in light of that example that you just gave. I think that in a way, actually, that generative AI is values the true core legal work, it actually makes it more value because putting race into a list of protected characteristics in a policy, that's like a paralegal could do that. A secretary could do that. That's 
that's not legal work. That's that's not high level legal analysis or you know what what like we all went to law school for. But I do think there are areas where you need accuracy and human touch still. Right. And that what what generative AI I think is going to do is eliminate all the undergrowth, like all the things that a paralegal could do, that a legal secretary could do. Now, now like a lawyer can just spend their time doing the core lawyer stuff. And because I, I don't think that it's at a level yet where it's going to replace the drafting of a motion, like reading a judge and thinking, gosh, what is that judge going to care about? How can I frame this argument? It's not there yet. Now, that's not to say that it won't get there because it's the craziest thing in the world. It improves all the time and the improvements are astounding. And but as of now, I think there's still room for that kind of high level legal thought. Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard how that's running out of data to consume, to train on, but yeah. it's not that it's running out. It's that it, it, they now have to license data or law firms and businesses that have proprietary data that still exists to train these things. And if it wants, can you imagine if Gen AI could train on all of Pacer? <laughs> like, I, I think we may have the closest thing to an AGI lawyer. <laughs> like if it could do that. I think there are, depending on what databases you're looking at, right. they'll tell you, hey, this judge accepts these kind of motions X amount of the time, and the judge rules on these Su successful motions have these things in common. Yeah. And trellis and then, comes and to mind for, for state that. courts. Yeah. Tra yeah trellis, exactly. I think, is doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like layer Gen AI on top of that. And it could be like, okay, so I'm going to frame it like this because that's what they usually grant. And I'm going to, you can see if you put on your sci-fi mind, you can see a pretty clear path that if they get a hold of that data, that they could do some pretty incredible things. But I think for now, there are a few things that Gen AI is really good at. One is like interpreting data. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good at it. If you have an interesting data set, it can do pretty incredible things in it. It can field like natural language questions and give you answers, accurate answers. And the other one is content. It's pretty good at content. That's what really blew people's mind when it was released. And it's getting better and better at content. But yeah, I, I do think there's, the law has a lot of data and a lot of content. And it's a pretty good match for, for some legal tasks. I think so. And I'm sure, and the reason I also wanted to frame the start of the conversation with a tool like 650 is doing some of the work that lawyers are not being hired to do because these potential clients and users of 650 don't want to pay an unknown billable hour to lawyers to do that kind of a work. So it's not like taking away business from lawyers per se, I wouldn't think so. But to the extent that an automation tool like 650 is like taking away quote billable work from lawyers, it, it allow like no lawyer likes to copy and paste or control F replace all. It, that's not that, I don't think that should be billable legal work that they're just doing from a form they got from some CLE provider anyway. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, like what, so this is the future with, with or without gen ai being incorporated to it or not which it's a i'm fascinated how you are incorporating it but i really think that just the way that a law is practiced or, or legal services are provided in the future like 650 is still even like in a legal zoom world that legal zoom has been around for a long time this is still cutting edge like this is still this is where i think a lot of this is going do you see it the same way yeah i think that the key is trust i think people use lawyers because they trust that authority or that degree or that, and it's, and they usually use it with things that they need extra care of. The same applies for software too. This is still, it's still in the Venn diagram of kind of HR and legal. Let's say, let, let, let's take the employee handbook. HR typically drafts the policies. Sometimes a lawyer will get involved. So maybe it's in the middle of kind of legal and HR in, in that Venn diagram. And like you were saying, that's not actually an area of law that most HR people are using a lawyer for. Most of the HR people are used to drafting those documents by themselves. I think what with COVID and with remote work, now that task has become so much more complicated, which is why I think 650 is catching on. But I think that you're right. I think some areas of law, I think, are tailor-made for this. Other areas of law, high stakes, big transactions, litigation, I think we'll pro probably always stay with a human. Right. Or, or some combination, right? I think, because at the end of the day, even if somebody keeps it in the system of 650, 
some human is reading the document at some point. You would hope so. I don't know. Maybe they're just using AI to summarize it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is yeah. possible. Uh, yeah. But this goes back even into the business model of 650 and also the value of the subscription model. So you talked about how you've just released, or I don't know about just released, but you've released this AI feature about going back in to update the document. So you're releasing new features. There's changes in law that happen. And, and you're also updating, you said, the like the logic in the background and improving on that and making that better over time. So that's an overtime offering. There's an ongoing promise there. And so naturally, the subscription model is the model that you picked because it's, in a way, it's software. You said you just called it software, but you still also offer like one-off purchases in the marketplace. So tell me about that strategy with the one-off purchases versus the subscription offering that you offer. And I'm also just curious to know, do, do you have, okay, we're going to start with the marketplace and then those purchasers pivot into the subscribers or do you just see like pure right into subscription more? You know, how it's evolved is actually the opposite of what you just said. So a lot of people come in and they say, I want to use 650, but they're really just in one state. For example, we can help companies with that, but they don't need our full suite of all 50 states and all the employment laws and everything. And so uh, we can offer them kind of a marketplace experience where they just get a single state employee handbook. And so that that kind of the most common use of our marketplace actually is sales co calls coming in and they're not a great fit for our full subscription, our fully packed subscription that we sell. And so we could move them to the marketplace and they can self-service there. Yeah. I mean, that okay, so that's interesting. But then, so is it like larger, like more enterprise level businesses that have, or, or not necessarily enterprise level, but just businesses that are fully distributed that maybe are more like likely to subscribe to the subscription offering? Yeah, yeah. So let's say one of our customers, let's say Boise State University, which is one of our favorite customers. They have employees like in over 40 states. So they're all over the place. They need our full subscription. Like we publish updates about what each state is doing. We'll update all of their documents according to all the different changes that every location is doing. But then take like a plumbing supply, or like a plumber who works out of New Jersey. Like they don't need the full thing that Boise State needs, but they probably still want to keep, keep up to date with just New Jersey. And so that marketplace is a nice, is a nice off ramp for the smaller companies we get that are just in kind of one, one jurisdiction. Really. And so that's, that's how the marketplace has evolved. We don't actually get that many sales of just people coming onto the marketplace and buying. We do get a, quite a bit of sales out of our sales funnel into that. Then what happens though in the example of the small business that's just in one state that wanted an employee handbook because they may be employed 20 something employees, they, you sell them that one product in the marketplace and then because their email is now on there, they get an email that says You've, there's been an update. Do they get the update as part of that purchase or is that an additional purchase that they have to make when the update comes through? So it started with, they just got the document and no updates. And we have now changed that into a mini subscription. And so now they have an account, they have everything that everybody else has, but they only have access to the updates in one state. So they, it's a single state subscription now. And, and yeah, as a software company, you don't get credit. You don't get as much credit for one-off purchases. Unless that's your business model and you get a consistent stream of one-off purchases. But we want to move everything into a subscription. That's where the value of our company is made is based on that subscription revenue. And so we actually saw that trend that it was a great off-ramp. And then, and then we moved it from being a single time, one-time purchase into being now you can just get updates all the time on that state. And we'll keep your document up to date in just one state. That's really interesting. I, I just noticed, I now I, I use 650 with some frequency, and I did just notice the upload docs section to upload it because I'm going to play around with this whole Gen AI thing now because I, I didn't realize that. I have to read a lot of emails. I'm sure you announced it, but I'm going to, I look forward to playing around with it and maybe letting my audience know about how that, what that experience was like later. Yeah. But, and actually, you know, if you go in, if you create, like go into your employee handbook section, if you, if you have. And yeah. then you create like an, an addenda for Alaska. That'll take you like five minutes. Mm -hmm. Then go and edit it. Change names, do this, do that. 
then go back in and change one of the answers. So say, we're not going to do PTO. We're going to call it unlimited time. And then you'll see when you do that. In fact, I can even demo it here if you want. Then Yeah, sure. With the time we have left. Absolutely. Yeah. So here, let me, I'll, I'll jump in here. See if this is helpful. Here's our tool. Let's go. Let's create a quick addenda. Here, document. Okay. 650. What kind of organization are you? Let's say I'm a company. And just for folks for the podcast, I highly recommend that you go to www.lawsubscribe.com so that you can watch this video or go to the link in the show notes to watch it on LinkedIn and share your comments in the comments section. But it's going through the workflow of doing the state addenda, asking really common sense questions that are easy to understand to fill out this information. Just had to do play-by-play -play for the podcast listeners, Kimball. Great, great. Okay, so we've answered all the questions. We're going to click generate. Now this will now, this document will appear in an online editor. So let's say state agenda. Okay. So here it is in here. Let's click edit. Then we can go and edit this. So we'll say crime victim leave, except if the crime is committed against Matthew. Okay. So you could do different things. Okay. So now if you hop out, so now that's been edited. Now let's change an answer. So again, this is an edited doc. It's very difficult to know what to do with an edited doc. And let's just change something simple. Let's change PTO to unlimited time offs and generate the doc. So first we'll show you, and I'm crossing my fingers that, that, that this works, we'll show you a red line of, hey, this is how our template changed. And then this is how this, and then this is your document here. So if you wanted to, you could search and be like, oh, I see. And then you could just put it into your thing. But now this, this thing has popped out. Try our AI beta merge. And this is see if AI can do a good job of putting those edits in. Yeah. Let's give it a try. Boop, boop, boop. Thinking. Then this will give you a red line. Hey, I'm replacing this with that. And that's it because it's a small document. So basically, and then finish editing. There you go. And so that'll make the change for you. And then we'll rate it. So then we'll ask every time we do it, we'll say, was this a good experience for you? Did it, did it make the edit well? And then we'll go back and refine it based on their answers. And we've got, we've tuned it up really well. Like it, it incorporates the edits into a customized document just remarkably well. Yeah. This is the future, right? That is, that's great. I, yeah, my, my, my clients are like, most of my clients, not all of them are like mom and pops, brick and mortar, small businesses. So they don't always have a lot of changes like that, but they do definitely need updates from time to time as the law yeah, changes. And then that same system works. Let's say, um, uh, one location, Chicago changes the amount of accrued sick leave from five hours to 10 hours. It'll slide that in right into a customized document without a problem. Yeah. Look, there's a lot of, there's a lot of offerings. We talked about the handbook, the state addenda. I actually need to do that for a client. And so I'll be, once we're done here, I'm going to go into 650 and do a state addenda for a client. Just hired somebody in Washington state in Illinois. Yeah. So that's good to know. And, and then, and, and look like from a practitioner standpoint, like, I find, and, and I used to check against every single one with great detail as I started to use the tool to make sure that it was accurate based on the law or what have you. And I will, I'll throw it in, I'm a Paxton user. I'll throw it into Paxton, like to sh confirm, double check that yes, this thing that 650 pumped out is in compliance, but I don't have to draft it from scratch. I'm not using Paxton to generate a state addenda from scratch yeah. because who knows it's Gen AI, but like I'm using another Gen AI tool. I'm leveraging 650 for the state yeah. addenda for a jurisdiction that I'm not super familiar with, but I'm not just going to blindly rely on it. I'm going to double check my work. And as a practicing attorney, that's what I'm going to do. And it's not going to take me very long since I'm not drafting yeah. it from scratch. I'm not doing the research based on the research, drafting it and just not knowing because that was the old world right now. I could have Gen AI research. I could have a, a, a database automation platform like 650. And it's just like this. It's just fun to be the lawyer of the future, Kimball. So thank you so much for you know, starting this company. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. And thank you for, for letting me talk about the company and, and to what we're doing. So, so let's just, let's wrap up a little bit here. So let's give them like a rundown of maybe some of the other popular documents that you have. Like you have your policy library, for example, like any popular policies or agreements, that kind of thing. Give us some of the, the highlights, knowing that there's, if, if folks were to go on there and look at all the documents that are offered, it's quite a few. Yeah. I would say there's three principal documents and then a lot of kind of documents that, that, that hover around those. The first is the employment agreement. That's the hiring paperwork. 
usually companies will couple that with an offer letter. The offer letter is more for the employee. It basically says, hey, here's your role and here's how much you're going to make and this is where you're going to work and thank you for joining us. The employment agreement is where the rubber hits the road for the company. Mm -hmm. So that has all the company protections. And there are, as you would guess, different rules in every place about what you can protect against and in what ways. Non-competes, for example, are they allowed or not allowed? It's actually a, a, a very, it's a hot topic right now because the federal government has maybe said you can't have non-competes, but every state has different rules about non-competes. In California and Oakland, you cannot have them. In Utah, it can only be a year. And so we know all those rules. All those go into the employment agreement. That That is our second most used tool, is that employment agreement tool. So that's the hiring paperwork, but it's all, it's really the most complicated document is that employment agreement. Then we have the employee handbook, which we talked about. That is different variations at end and everything, but it's really run off the same rules engine. And then we have separation paperwork, which is probably our like hottest, hottest document. So that is what can you ask someone to waive when you're letting them go? What rights can you say, okay, if I give you this severance payment, you waive these rights. And there are different rules in each place. Like in Massachusetts, you can't waive age-related claims. And you can only do it in certain ways. And, and in this and in this structure, that's the third document that 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 is really our marquee document. So there's one really marquee hiring document, our employee handbook suite, and then one marquee separation document that 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 kind of carry the day for us. And for business owners, if you're listening or you're in HR or you're a fractional general counsel like me, 650.com is the website. It's easy to reach out to request a demo. I just put in the in the chat on, on LinkedIn, a link to the resource library where folks could sign up to the newsletter. But even if, like, like when I, ha I get inbound sometimes, Kimball, from small business owners in different jurisdictions. I'm only licensed in Illinois. I know some fractional GCs are like, well, if I, as long as I'm not going to court, I'll represent somebody anywhere. That's yeah. not me. Um, and, and so I will, if I happen to have inter you know, interviewed somebody on the podcast that does predictable, affordable pricing for small businesses like me, I'll, I'll refer them. But that doesn't, that's not always the case. But one of the places I always point them to is this resource library because there are so many fantastic resources that 650 is pumping out. I don't know how you're also, you're building a business and creating all these resources. Um, but it, just for listeners, it's a great place to go to learn about things. Like even b back in the day, I would Google, this is before I would search in perplexity, but I would Google like a legal concept as I was starting a research project. And then I would read some lawyer blogs to get me started. Yeah. Uh, and then I would start my research. But if you're a lawyer or you're in HR at a company, the 650 resource library is a good place to just get started. No more Google searching around to, to maybe land on some random resource from some law firm website, right? Um, what kind of effort is going into all of those resources that you're putting out there? We have very talented lawyers. They're also like very engaging, which we're lucky about. So we end up having a lot of webinars. We hold about a webinar a week um, about a hot topic. There are plenty of hot topics to have in employment law because it's changing all the time. And so that's been great. And, and then I think we've also just made a conscious decision to use our content to help bring awareness to the company. We've been really successful at that. For example, in, in that resource library, there's like a map of non-compete rules across the nation, or there's a map of all the policies that are required in every single state. And so those take up a lot of time to actually put out there, but they're great. They're great. They help people, which is really fun. And they drive people in, into the company too. We wouldn't do it if there wasn't a business rationale for it. But I think sometimes people can get really protective of information that they that they think that they could charge for. And it's you need to let a little bit of that go to charge for the real core value proposition that that you have. And so we we try to be liberal with that and release as much information as we can. You're not showing them the the, the content of the documents. Yeah. <laughs> you might be talking all about it, but you're not like actually giving them the yeah. thing. Well, sometimes we do. So, oh, um, really? For example, we have a free AI in the workplace policy. Oh, yes, or, that's true. Or we have a free NDA. Or so we'll offer. I gosh, I think that we offered free politics in the workplace. Now, <laughs> section like how do you even manage that? It's been a couple right. of the craziest thing. And so, and so we will occasionally even just release the the document 
uh, as well. It's if you think like, hey, actually, a lot of people are asking about this. This could help a lot of people and build awareness for six fifty. Yeah, I, yeah, I think there's a lot of great lessons there for the small uh, law firm and solo owners out there who are thinking about how to market their business. Put out some good educational content, and I've started doing that with the Law for Kids podcast. Just very broadly, like not even like not even related to my practice area, just trying to put good educational content out there. But like 650, it's meant to eventually drive some business back into the firm. So let me see if I, for the video viewers, the Law for Kids oh, podcast. That's right? great. I love that. Uh, yeah. So anyway, with that, I do have one more fun question for you. But before we get to that, I mentioned some of the places folks could go. Any, you just want to mention maybe a few more times like where they could get reach out to you or someone from 650, like where should people go? Yeah, anybody who's interested in 650 can go to 650.com. That's spelled out S-I-X-F-I-F-T-Y.com. And you can browse our offerings and you can you can request a demo if you want. We serve both companies directly and we serve what, what we call service providers. So HR consultants, PEOs, law firms, use our tool to then service their clients too. So we, both of those channels are open. And so if you're a, a lawyer and you're like, gosh, I don't know how to service these employment law questions that are coming about every state, we're a great resource for that too. And, and if it were up to me, Kimball, I would have every subscription-based law firm, so new solo, leveraging this tool. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say they should use the code law subscribe when they're signing up. But yeah. But with that though, fun question for you, Kimball. And that is, is a hot dog a sandwich and why? Oh, geez, you know, very hot topic within 650 as well. This has been hotly debated. We have a morning uh, Zoom call, and this has taken up a lot of airspace. I'm going to say it is a sandwich, okay? I think it has all the ingredients. It's got the bread, the meat in the middle, and bread again. So I think, you know, those are the key elements of a sandwich. And so I'm voting sandwich. <laughs> Well, 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 to anybody who sees this from 650, I hope uh, you're not scared into not voicing your non-sandwich opinions on the next all company Zoom meeting now that the CEO has staked, uh, you know, where he is. And it's right. 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 Uh, all right. Just stick around for 30 seconds, but we'll go off live here in a second to all the live viewers on LinkedIn. Thanks so much for coming.